from Title On Air. Welcome to I'm in the Band. I'm your host, Allison Moore. I can see what you're trying to say to me if I don't explain it away. I'm in the band and I deserve to be here and I do anyway. We got the queen of all storytellers for you this time, Julia K. Fritz, guitarist and part time screamer in Pussy Galore. Action Swingers, STP, Free Kitten. Sometimes I get so desperate, I get a pain deep inside of me, and I want to hurt someone. Oh, baby, step a little closer. Hi, I'm Julie K. Fritz, and I'm a professor and a mom and a musician and a know-it-all and a braggart and a liar. Yeah, we'll have to get to the liar part. <laughs> I was sort of lying about being a liar. Back in the early 90s, right before my band Bratmobile recorded our first album, Julie told Aaron, our guitarist, that she wanted to give me some screaming tips. And I was like, yay! The trick to doing it is blow out your voice every fucking time. A lesson I sadly never got. But I met with Julie recently. We talked about all sorts of things, including her first band, Pussy Galore, which she formed in the 80s with college friend and fellow dropout, John Spencer. To some, Pussy Galore's lo-fi garage noise challenged what rock and roll, or even music, could be. But, as Julie told me, the critics didn't always see it that way. We would read all these articles that would say, like, Pussy Galore, they're just this sprawling, out-of-tune mess. And I would just be so offended because I knew we practiced five days a week. We had a different set every night, but songs always went one song into another. And to do that, you have to be a very well-oiled machine. And so I always thought, wow, like we just played 15 songs or 17 songs in like 32 minutes. I don't like, I consider that like, to me, that was like, that's quite an accomplishment, Gabriel. <laughs> like you got through all that shit really quickly without a break, not even a sip of, of that Coca-Cola that looks so refreshing on your amp. And like, you know, I'd light a cigarette and put it on the side of my amp going like, I'm going to come back to you, darling. And I would never have one second to pick up that cigarette, like only if a string broke. I grew up in D.C. on the mean streets of Georgetown and in a large, complicated family. My parents were, you know, A, busy with their own social and business lives and creative lives and, and, you know, had children and then just sort of ignored their children for the most part, I guess, like all 70s parents. And... I had three older brothers, and I mentioned them because they were sort of impossibly cool. So they came of age at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. So they were full freak flag waving hippies doing tons of fucking drugs, having, you know, gorgeous girlfriends and and incredibly disreputable crew of friends. Since I was a teenager in the 80s, I sort of rebelled against their rebellion. So, you know, I was completely straight edge. I was just a total fucking goody-goody. But that was how D.C. was. Like, D.C., we were very precocious in certain ways and very backwards in others. Unlike everybody in D.C., I think you felt, you know, A, you were liberal, and B, you felt very connected and in the know. Everybody knew people who worked for the Washington Post or politicians or um, policy wonks. And those were the people who your parents had over for dinner. And you developed at a very young age this weird combination of idealism with deep, deep cynicism because you knew, you thought you knew at least how the system worked.
my headmistress committed murder uh, my freshman year of high school. It was very exciting, of course. <laughs> the Scarsdale Diet, which was like the number one best-selling New York Times nonfiction bestseller. Scarsdale Medical Diet. Would you welcome Dr. Herman Tarnauer? And I had actually gone on the Scarsdale diet, which was basically like have toast with grainy mustard and a cup of coffee and call it a day. It was a very punishing diet. A low-fat cottage cheese with a tablespoonful of low-fat sour cream, lots of walnuts. So I applied to Madeira at the last moment, and I was interviewed by our headmistress, Mrs. Jean Harris. His first acknowledgement was to a friend who helped with the research and writing of his bestseller, Jean Harris, school teacher, historian, socialite, and mistress of Herman Tarnauer for the past 14 years. And I'm like, I think my mother maybe mentioned, oh, Julia just was on a diet. She was like, that's an excellent diet. In fact, my friend wrote it. But although she presented a confident face to the world, inside she was in turmoil. And then through a series of bizarre events. She was living off dexedrine, better known as speed. This made her schizophrenic and liable to burst into fits of anger. Nicknamed Integrity Jean, she lived a secret life of desperate passion for the doctor, who was notorious for a succession of casual affairs. The day before she, our spring vacation, the school, <laughs> the school targeted a bad group of seniors. She had ironically just upset her board by expelling four girls for smoking pot. I wrote a letter to Mrs. Harris going like, I support, you, you know, you and the judiciary's decision to get rid of those bad eggs. <laughs> and I put it on her, t on her desk. So we you know, all leave for spring vacations half day. And our spring vacation is three weeks. And she drives up to Scarsdale and ostensibly to kill herself, but shoots him five times in the back. And I remember being on a beach in Jamaica on that Monday, and like the front of the International Herald Tribune says like, headmistress kills diet doctor. And I was like, oh my fucking God, like Mrs. Harris just killed the Scarsdale diet doctor. And approximately one year later, I get a letter, and it, I notice that the letter is, is from a prison. And it's Mrs. Harris, and she's writing me to thank you for my note of support. So the campus must be alive with daffodils right now and beautiful. You know, I envy you. You know, thank you for your letter of support, Julia. You know, uh, love, you know, Mrs. Jean Harris. And of course, I had offered her just support for kicking out the druggies. Not, not for the trials she had gone through in her prison term, but that's my Jean Harris story. <laughs> You kind of had a rebellion at some point, and I don't know if that happened before you started playing music. I mean, my big rebellion was dropping out of college because I had been self-designed to do nothing but go to the college of my choice and do very well once I was there. The thing about me is I've always had a perverse sense of, of one of the things being a goody-goody ha means having a strong voice. And that voice may be voicing something very unpopular. I wanted to be a goody-goody, but I didn't want to be a nerd. I wanted to be cool and outrageous, but I also wanted to be a good girl. And all of that existed before I started the band Pussy Galore. But then Pussy Galore, I think, helped me tap into a huge unending well of anger that I didn't even realize was there until I was screaming on stage. So 
so I arrive at college and I have, you know, a bunch of records I'm very attached to. But uh, a bunch of my friends were, you know, artsier than I was. I was not particularly artsy at all. I wasn't really creative at all either. I was just not driven in that way. But so every, all these boys were in bands and I thought they were terrible. I thought the bands were just awful. And I liked making fun of them, which was, I like making fun of anything. So I just became like an inveterate teaser of them. And I had a boyfriend who was a townie who was a lot younger than me. He was also in a terrible band. I always had a lot of bravado. And I just remember just berating these boys, just sort of saying, like, I can't play an instrument. I have no desire to be in a band. Nonetheless, any band that I was in would be better than the bands you guys are in. And I would take it more seriously. I would tour. I would make records. And you guys are just lame bands in a fucking small college town playing shit gigs to your friends, not getting paid. You know, I don't even know how you call what you do being in a band. And and because I said that and, and John Spencer, the um, kid who I would eventually start Pussy Galore with, that all registered with him. He was just like, oh, here's this sort of, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a driven weirdo, and this is a driven weirdo. And, you know, if she's serious at all, she, she probably will commit to something in a way that other people won't commit. I mean, I, John and I have never really, it seemed almost, you know, it seemed accidental that we would start a band. I had bought a guitar on a lark, um, because uh, the drummer, John Hamill, who would go on to be Pussy Galore's first drummer, I had met him during the summer, super fun guy. He played with various bands, and we went to a music store because he needed some drum heads. And I just pointed to this cheap-ass Hondo guitar and this really shitty PV amp, and I was just like, maybe I should get a guitar. And I, I got the guitar, and I brought it home, and John tried to show me how to play it. He just tried to show me how to do an E chord, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't make my fingers do it. I had very poor eye-hand coordination, and I was like, well, this is terrible. Like, playing a guitar is hard, and I can't read music, and by the way, why is that called reading something? Like, I that's just dots on a page. (laughs) So I had technically bought a guitar, but I had not started playing guitar. I had not even started fooling around the guitar. But Spencer calls me and he's like, hey, I I heard you bought a guitar. And I was just like, John was a very difficult person to talk to. And he had gone out with one of my best friends. And I was just like, what the fuck is Spencer doing calling me? Like, what? And I actually had no idea what he was talking about. But I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I am. I had no idea. And he goes, so we'll start the band. And I was just like, uh, uh, yes, yes. And he goes, well, I guess if we're starting a band, then I'll move to D.C., can you, like, try to find us a practice space? Maybe me an apartment? Oh, a practice space. What is, I guess that need, like, I had no idea. I didn't even, those words didn't even mean anything to me. I was living at home. I, could, I just couldn't even wrap my mind around anything. And I remember mentioning to my mother, like, you know, this kid from Brown is, he's dropped out too, and he's coming to D.C., and I, I guess, you know, we're going to try starting a band. And she was just like, but... Julie, you don't play anything. And I was like, no, I don't. And she goes, well, how does that work? And I was like, I have absolutely no idea. And she goes, well, that doesn't sound very good. And I was like, well, I don't think it's going to be very good. Um, And I was like, I just don't even know if I can pull off it being very bad. So we started Pussy Galore, and I don't think I could have started a band with anybody else. 
because John had such an incredible work ethic and was so creative and so sort of problem solving. I mean, he was a problem creator too, but he was also <laughs> problem solving. And I presented this problem of like, I like, I don't even think I like put the guitar around my neck on a strap. And I just like held up my hands and was like, I don't play. And he was like, well, just try this. And he like maybe played two notes. And I was just like, plonk. And, and I was like, I can't do that. And I just kept presenting him with more limitations. He's just like, well, just hit the E string, the low E string. Like, just go one, two, three, four. And I'd go like, one, two. And then my hand would slip and I wouldn't make the the third and that's what we did. He just would like start off by always telling me like, well, maybe you could play something like this. And I'd be like, I don't know what fucking planet you're on, man. I don't even know what you just did. I, I no, I can't do that. And he would just simplify and simplify and simplify until we were within the realms of my limitations, which was basically getting my pick to strike the string of a guitar. Um, and that's where I started. I started at the most basic level of just turning on an amp and facing it and having feedback come out of it and that being your contribution to a song. I mean, the weird thing about it was that we practiced a lot. I'm a hard worker. You know, I do my homework. And so even though I felt completely not up to the task, we went fast. We, he moved in September. We recorded our first four song, seven inch in October. And we went on a U.S. tour in December. And I mean, I had to like string my guitar with all low E strings because if I broke the, if I broke, like I was, could only play the low E string. And if I broke it, I was completely lost. So we just put like four low E strings on my guitar and I was throwing up probably seven times a day because I had so much stage nerves, you know, like, that, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. So the first tour was like just incredibly gnarly and no place could, you know, print our name on any bill. We agreed to do the Peach of Immortality tour because we had recorded this seven inch, but we couldn't get anybody to press the seven inch because of the name and the song titles. No pressing plant would press it. And Tom had some in on it. He had worked for some a uh, record distribution company. So he found us the people who would press that first seven inch. We had the same thing. Our second uh, release was this 12 inch called Groovy Hate Fuck. And that was also like, I think we went through seven people to try to get it pressed. Not only were you having kind of troubles with people getting to recognize, I guess, even just it as music, right? Right. Because I saw that also John Spencer said something about like calling it anti-music or that yeah, that was the right, goal. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yes, that but, was a problem. <laughs> but it's interesting too because with you guys being so self-disciplined and really serious about things, but then also calling it anti-music. You know, John was a semiotics major and at Brown, and I'm always very suspicious of them <laughs> um, because they're all about deconstruction and everything is well thought out. And it was very, very intellectual. So sometimes the way we pursued things or what our aims were did not necessarily, it didn't all line up. He often referred to it as like, it's just rock and roll. And I, I like, I'd hear him say that during interviews and I'd just be like, you're an asshole. I'm like, it isn't, it isn't. You can keep, we can keep saying that, but it's not actually true. And we sort of hate rock and roll. Like, but he would get tired of trying to position us. It was hard to position what we were doing. One, two. As the 
woman in Pussy Galore, did you ever experience like kind of double standards um, and different treatment by either people within the band or just people in the scene or club people, security people, whatever? I, I mean, yes. I, I, it, was, it was a complicated situation. You know, I was such a non-musician. I had so little confidence. And then I just had a lot of bark, you know. Um, but I, I had very little bite, but I had a lot of bark. I would stand on stage, and if my guitar went out of tune, John would, like, come over and manually start tuning my guitar while I just like it hung from my neck and it was like a mom coming to tie your fucking shoe it's incredibly emasculating um whether you're a male or a a female to have some dude come and tune your fucking guitar while you're wearing it on stage right but I couldn't do it I could I had no ear and so I had this one side of me that was very much sort of like well you don't know what you're fucking doing and I realized that, that, you know, after being a musician for a long time, it was like, you don't actually want to be able to play your guitar. You know, like that's a, almost no interest to me. I played sort of backwards guitar, which you couldn't have asked anybody else to play. Like you couldn't tell somebody else to just play this one string, right? And you wouldn't have had anybody else replace those parts. But then they are missing when they're not there. I mean, my big thing was I just wanted everybody to know, like, okay, I'm the girl in the band. And like the girl in the band, you're the weak link, right? Everybody was going to treat me like the weak link. And I wanted people to know that I am not fucking John and I've never fucked John. And I'm the bad fucking girl in this band who is not here because I'm fucking somebody in the band. That was like a paramount importance to my 19 and 20 year old self and apparently my 52 year old self too. Then the other thing was like I can bring um, all this sort of passion and intention and rigor to an endeavor even if I can't play the fucking guitar. Like you're not going to be able to put your finger on exactly what I bring to something, but take me away and I will leave a hole. When I finally left Pussy Galore and they did one more record, there was some life force that was missing from it. And I mean, John and I, we were very angry at the world. We were also very angry with each other. That brings a certain frisson of excitement and tension to any show, right? I, like, I love bands where the people in the band sort of hate each other because you can feel that, right? You know, there was an alchemy between him and me. Yeah, I kind of couldn't believe that they went on without you. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the breakup or why you guys broke up or not but I mean John and I when we formed that band you know we were starting it and we were very serious but it went on for much longer than we ever would have expected it to and you know again I would have never like if I was going to hitch my star to somebody I would have picked somebody else somebody more agreeable than John (laughs) and I'm sure he would have said I would have picked somebody much less obnoxious than Julie and how, how is your relationship today? Very close. Yeah, you know, I have such a soft spot. He's such a lovely guy. I should say that he comes off as an asshole, but boy, John is one of the sweetest men I've ever met. And we were just dumb. We were young and we were dumb and we talked too much, I think. And I think I still do. <laughs> I think after that you were in primarily girl bands so like STP right STP that was four girls and because I didn't have a John in that group to show me what to play I ended up writing a lot of stuff because it was much easier for me to play what I had written you know if I wrote it then I could fucking play it right so it was a great sort of laboratory for me actually having to like own being a guitar player before I had sort of just been like 
I, I'm here for the pain and I stay for the anger. <laughs> But the guitar playing is sort of incidental. And like, I just don't get how people do. I can't even do sort of like one, two, three, four. Like I, I can't even, if I'm singing along literally with what I'm playing, I can't really do it. Like I just can't sing and play. So every time I sing, it's a trade-off. Like I have to come off my guitar to sing. And then go, fuck you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think I sort of rushed into SDP a little too quickly. It was really great, but I, it was very much all of a sudden sort of on my shoulders. Like I was probably making the whole thing much more serious. Like we recorded fairly quickly. Then I accepted it, this tour for us. And it's just like, because this was the way I was used to doing things, STP did not sort of have time to grow and experiment and and develop. It was more like, oh, we're starting a band. Okay, this is what you do when you start a band. Go. (laughs) And STP, people were hungry for that shit. They were hungry for women. I think we were good, but I think we also were feeding this huge need for for the kind of band we were to exist, right? So immediately there was just too much interest from my point of view, like just too much of a lens and too much of a like, okay, so you're going to record a record and a record and a record and a record. And I was just like, oh, wait a second. Like we were just trying this out. Like I had set us on that course, but I was the person who was like, no. So were they bummed about? I think they were. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that, they sort of knew that when we started. I mean, it was always supposed to be sort of, this is going to be fun. But Sigalore wasn't really fun. You know, and it's 1990 or something. You know, it's like 1989, 1990. I think that's when we existed. And so it's like, it's two years before punk breaks, right? It's like, we're on this tour with Sonic Youth and Nirvana. And where we start off on the tour on the East Coast, by the time we're getting to the West Coast, you know, they're playing huge venues. Uh, the funniest STP story was when we were playing at the Paramount. People are really far away. I mean, granted, we're the first band, but people are really far away. And I'm like, Seattle, you fucking pussies. Like, get up here. Like, what's your fucking, why are you sitting in your seats? You know, why aren't you up here? I thought you were wild. And so, like, a kid would come up, and then a bouncer would throw him out. And then we get we get done with the show, and, like, I go outside just to smoke a cigarette, and there are all these kids, and they're like, Julie, you guys were great. I mean, I only saw part of it because, you know, you made us come up, and then we were kicked out because we weren't allowed to come out of our seats. <laughs> and I was like, What? And then they're like, yeah, you made us come up. And uh, the thing is, that we, we would have been up. Well, all of us would have been up, but we weren't allowed to. So we all got kicked out so we can't see Nirvana or Sonic Youth. <laughs> You were in STP and then Free Kitten, and both of those were maybe not always all girl, but mostly girl. And I just wondered how the dynamic was different in those bands than Action Swingers or especially Pussy Galore. I mean, I had always been the person, John often set up the shows, but I was always the person who like collected the money. I I would say like the Jewish person wears the visor in the band. So I was like, you know, very much involved in all the business side of, of the band. And so when it came to STP and all of a sudden I was the direct point person for clubs, just all of a sudden having people treat us like we were morons and idiots who could be taken advantage of. And I could only chalk it up to one thing. I mean, it could only have to do with the fact that we were four girls. My personality, the way I had dealt with them, hadn't changed one bit. And like I had been this kind of point person before. But the one thing that was missing was like the cock and balls or something in the band in it. So it put a really fine point on it. And, you know, even with Free Kitten, I mean, 
you know, Free Kitten was pretty cushy because Sonic Youth were in a position that things went smoothly. We didn't, you know, we didn't, Kim and I didn't have to really lift a finger to make something happen for that band. We just had to say yes, no, yes, no, or something. Everybody in Free Kitten had been in other bands that or were still in other bands that were much bigger than Free Kitten or Pussy Galore. So you had Kim from Sonic Youth, you had Mark Eyeball from Pavement, you had Yoshimi from The Boredoms and that and me. And that was and so I always said that Free Kitten was a band of second bananas um, because none of us were the lead person in the primary band we were known for. And when Kim and I started Free Kitten, we had this double thing of like, people treating us like elder stateswomen. And that may sound good on paper, but it was not good. And so I just remember arriving to England and we're playing and we open up Melody Maker and there's essentially a full page cartoon. And it's Kim with a walker, me with a cane. And Mark Eyeball who I love and has a very babyish face, but who was like two years older than me. He's got, and like, they've even put wrinkles on Yoshimi and he's got like a, a pacifier in his mouth. And I was just like, oh my fucking God. Like they are just like these old hags who've been around forever. And I was just like, I started a fucking band when I was 19. I'm 25. I'm not an old hag. You're not allowed to call me an old hag. If Pavement had been playing the next week, they wouldn't have done a cartoon of of those guys with wrinkles and Mark Eyeballed with a pacifier in his mouth. I was just like, these people aren't younger than me. These people are often older than me. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, like the boy bands are allowed to age with right. dignity or whatever, but we're not. I know, I remember when Bratmobile got back together, it was like four years later only. Some journalists were, yeah, oh, talking about, oh, she was wheezing and she could barely like keep her breath and all this, you know, and just kind of, yeah, kind of haggish description. Yeah, just like this like whole notion that you are now too long in the tooth. And like, before you were too young and winsome, we didn't have to take you seriously because you were just a sexy chick in a short skirt. And now, hey, we don't want to see you in a short skirt. Well, Julie, Julia, K. Fritz. I am really glad that you gave me my copy of the STP 7-inch. I also want to thank you for being here and speaking with me today. thank you, Allison, for being such a patient listener. You're the ideal listener. (laughs) No, you're a great interviewer, but I wish I I would. Next time, it'll actually be a conversation. How about that? I've got questions for you. Really? Yes, I do. I do. I'm in the Band is produced by me, Allison Wolf, and me, Jonathan Shiflet. You can hear all of our episodes on Title On Air and follow us at I'm in the Band Podcast. I'm in the band. Wow.